Each woman will have their own unique experience around that. We need to be able to say goodbye and become emotionally complete with everything that we're incomplete with currently. We stay busy, which just keeps us disconnected physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. In our previous episodes with Kirsten Fry, a certified advanced grief recovery specialist, she mentioned the myths of grief. And I thought that that was deserving of its own episode today. So we're going to have fun and we're going to myth bust with Kirsten Frey. <laughs> Welcome back. Great. We're myth busters. We're myth that. busters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the myth and you are going to bust it. Okay. And of course, <laughs> it's going to be focused on midlife because that's what Teton's about. So myth number one. And by the way, this is based on the six myths of grief from the Grief Recovery Institute, correct? Right. Okay, and we will put that link um, as a resource for everyone? Absolutely. Great. So myth number one, don't feel bad. Yes, don't feel bad, don't feel sad. That's kind of what we hear. Most of these myths that we're going to cover, we heard them usually really early on in life, primarily before the age of eight, I would say. And so this is one that starts off, you know, don't feel bad, like, the uh, the example that we use is um, often lost. The first loss we see as young children is with a pet. Mm -hmm. So our family dog dies. And of course, as a parent, we don't want to see our children hurting. So we're like, don't feel bad. It's okay. We'll go get another puppy, right? Or another dog. And so what happens is the child then learns to distract themselves with the new pet and not feel bad, but the truth is they do feel bad about losing that pet. And so even though they might get a new dog, it's a different relationship. And we haven't actually addressed what their emotion is mm -hmm. about losing that dog. Like maybe the dog came up and slept on their bed every night, yeah. right? Or the dog is the one they told all their secrets to and their dreams and everything. And so when we don't allow ourselves to be sad or any of the other conflicting emotions that can go with grief, we're learning not to be able to tell our emotional truth, which, as you know from our previous podcasts, shows up in other areas mm -hmm. of our life down the road. Absolutely. And, you know, midlife, perimenopause, your last period, which is, you know, technically the day of menopause and everything else is post-menopause. Don't feel bad. You have freedom now. No more periods. No more tampons. Mm -hmm. Is that really what we should be telling ourselves <laughs> well and there there might be part there of is that. freedom yeah Th yeah so there might be relief <laughs> we yeah. don't have to like buy the things and you know track our periods for vacations and that kind of thing anymore so there might be this is where the conflicting ideas of all these conflicting emotions around the end of our change in a familiar pattern of behavior and the reality is it, it's such a big deal when we get our periods that it's also a big deal when our periods stop because it's that sense, you know, when we first start our periods, it's like you coming into womanhood. Mm -hmm. So then now what does that mean that we're moving into menopause? Yeah, we're not that, a woman? Yeah, exactly. So it's like, don't feel bad about that. Well, of course, you're going to have some feelings about that. And each woman will have their own unique experience around that. It might be because my body's not responding or reacting in the ways that I'm used to it responding and reacting. I'm carrying extra weight. I'm not sleeping at night. I'm having these crazy hot flashes. I'm irritable. I'm anxious. You know, I don't feel intimate with my partner. There's all these changes that are happening. It's okay to have feelings around that. We are human beings. We are meant to have this wide range of human uh, emotions. And when we try to control that, I always say grief and joy are two um, sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. So when you don't allow yourself to feel all the conflicting emotions around grief, you're shutting down that side of the spectrum. You're also then not going to allow yourself to be able to feel joy mm -hmm. and contentment, satisfaction and happiness because yeah. then we're always waiting for the other shoe to drop. And then we live in this life that's very, you know, attempt at control, very, you know, sort of emotionally stoic. But the truth is, that's just us trying to prevent pain. That's us trying to mm -hmm. protect ourselves from pain or uncomfortable emotions. But the truth is, when things happen, like we move through menopause and all these changes are happening, it doesn't, we still feel all the feelings. Feel the feelings and then you can experience the joy. I always say you got to name it to tame it. Love that. So let's move on to the second myth. 
replace the loss. You kind of touched on the puppy replacement. Right. Because those, I find all of these myths tend to go in twos. Yes. So they go hand in hand. So it's like, don't feel bad. We'll get you. So it kind of meshes all in together. So the replace the loss happens when, you know, we have the pet loss and then maybe we go to school and we have our first heartbreak, right? Where we fell in love for the first time, you know, we're young, like when we were in elementary school or even like high school where our heart really felt mm -hmm. like it was broken. And everybody tells us, don't worry, there's plenty of fish in the sea or he or she wasn't good enough for you. And, you know, all these well-meaning, well-intentioned things, but they're not exactly emotionally helpful. So we learn to like, oh, just get another boyfriend. Oh, just get another job. Oh, just get another without actually emotionally completing what was incomplete for us from that experience. Then now we move on into menopause or this midlife where it's like we're trying to replace, you know, the things that we have, but we can't, right? It's a change. So it's being able to be emotionally honest about how we feel about this next season that we're stepping into in life but we need to be able to say goodbye and become emotionally complete with everything that we're incomplete with currently about this, like saying goodbye to this aspect of ourselves that, you know, that we had periods and that we could have children if we wanted to. We have to say goodbye to that. And that's, I think we forget that we need these completions. That's why we have things like funerals and weddings and graduations and retirement parties and you know, birthing parties for our kids because we have a menopause party. I've you seen should. that. I think I've seen that trending somewhere, but yes. I think that's fantastic because we need these things, these little experiences to help bring us together. All of our women friends who are all moving through menopause in their own way too, where we get the guidance, care, love, and support and compassion that we need as we move through just a season of our life mm -hmm. that's, you know, got a lot of change with it. Speaking of the other women going through it with us, sisterhood, community, myth number three, grieve alone. So this was one of mine <laughs> because I learned this very early on. So the first um, like death in the family that we had was with my mother's father who lived in Germany. So I had only met him twice in my life. So I didn't have a relationship with him per se. He was my opa and, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of this mythical person. But was really interesting for me was seeing how it affected my mother. It was the first time I had seen her cry, which freaked me out because <laughs> my mom was strict and like, like had no emotions around that kind of thing. So to see her visibly upset and crying was like, oh, this is really bad. Mm -hmm. And so I remember going to sit with her and just hold her hand because I felt so bad for her. And we just feel that like yes. wanting to be with somebody in their moment. And my dad saying like, no, no, give your mom some space. She just needs her privacy because she's moving through it. So we learn, oh, we just give people time and space, right, to move through it on their own. Well, some people might need some quiet time on their own. Other people, let's face it, when something great happens to us, what's the first thing we do? Call our friend, call our, our loved ones, Absolutely. tell them. Yeah. And it's the same thing when the terrible things happen in our life too. We want to share them, right? It's a sh We want to share how we're feeling. And yet we do that with the good things in our life, but we're hesitant or we've been taught that it's not okay to share the um, more difficult aspects of our life. And so we grow up with this conditioning around needing to grieve alone, mm -hmm. um, which keeps us isolated at a time that we need the love, care, compassion, and support probably more than ever. Absolutely. Time heals all wounds. That is myth number four. Ugh. So this one is confusing sometimes because there is an element of truth to that. So the, you know, as you just said, time heals all wounds is sort of the cliche that we hear. And there is a bit of truth to that because there is an element of time for any kind of healing that we go through. So for example, if you break your arm, the bones need mm -hmm. like six to eight weeks time to knit and heal themselves. So there is that time component. But if you broke your arm and didn't take an action step, so if you just kind of like put it in a sling and continued on with your day, A, there's going to be a lot of pain. B, the bone might not re-knit properly. And now we're into all other kinds of problems um, health-wise. And so the action step of going to the doctor, getting an x-ray, getting a cast on your arm, and then allowing the healing time to happen, it's the action steps that you take within the time that help that bone yep. to heal. 
It's the same thing with our heart and our emotions. So there is a component of time to process the experience, but it's the action steps that you take within the time that will move you to your healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's okay to say that some wounds don't necessarily get healed. It's just emotional wounds. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's, it's allowing, and they might change over time is what I'm trying to say, right? Like the grief process, it th doesn't necessarily, is there an end time? I guess that's my real question. Is there an end time to grief? Uh, such a great question. I think it depends on what the experience is and the circumstance is. I think there are some losses we carry with us mm -hmm. our whole lives. It's learning how to be, can we become emotionally complete with that relationship and still feel sad? So for example, I have people that come to see me for the for grief recovery. And what I tell them is, it's not like you're never going to not feel sad about that person or menopause or any of those things that we go through. But we learn how to tell our emotional truth, to sit with the feelings, right? To move through those feelings and be honest about them and then move through it. And we're changed by it. But sometimes that's also part of our growth mm -hmm. experience. And we learn things about going through these um, grieving experiences or losses or changes that we move through that make us better people, more compassionate. Myth number five, Kirsten. Be strong for others. <laughs> so the be stronger, a be strong for others, that was my other two. So typically we have one or two of these myths that we gravitate to most. Mine were always grieve alone and be strong. You know, so not surprising that I was a police officer. So being a contribution and being of service has is one of my core values. And so being strong. I grew up with that conditioning of like, you don't show emotions, you don't show your weaknesses, you deal with your feelings on your own. Um, and then you move into a profession where obviously you're dealing with some difficult situations sometimes, sometimes crisis or traumatic type situations. And to be strong for me was a credibility issue that if I was somehow had emotion or a vulnerable moment that I would lose credibility somehow. Uh -huh. That was my conditioning. So that's something I needed to work through. When we go through menopause, I think a lot of women, it's like, well, it's something all women go through. Yeah. Right. Just power Just, through it. I did. Yeah. Power through it. And how well is that working for you? <laughs> because you're not telling the emotional truth, which is like some days you're on fire and you've got all of it going on. And then there's other days it is difficult to get out of bed or we're crying in the shower. Yeah. Right. And so... It's being able to understand that you can be strong or you can be human. And what I have found is being strong really feeds into us feeling isolating. And often it's us that's isolating ourselves from the care, compassion, and support that we need when we go through these challenging times. And so I always say, be human. And you know what? It takes bravery to be able to open up and really admit the emotional truth of what you're moving through at that time. It's interesting you use the word bravery. I was just reading an op-ed about someone who said that by talking so much about menopause right now because of the so-called menopause moment, that women are actually going to end up uh, having the opposite effect and hurting themselves because we're going to make you know, the men aware um, or society aware of our weakness what do you say to that? I mean, this, this really, this whole be strong, always perfect, wow. strong. Yeah. It really shocked me to read that because I, hopefully that's a minority of people who think that, but. You saying that I can just feel heaviness in yeah. my heart. It feels, that feels like a heavy burden to carry. And I don't know about you, but that is not anything that I'm interested in carrying uh, forward no, anymore. No, my, I, I would, what, it makes me actually want to talk about it more well, uh, because. Well, yeah, because if 50% of the population is moving through this experience at some point, it's like telling your kids don't go through puberty or don't talk well, about Let's all talk puberty. about it because if we're aware of it, somehow that's. Yeah. Yeah. I would say knowledge is power, right? To help us move through. And it also helps with awareness because then it's being able to set our healthy boundaries. Then it's also opening us up to compassion mm -hmm. for another human being. 
sometimes people want to help us, but they don't even know that we need well, they're the help. They're not even aware. Because yeah. we're not letting anybody know that yeah. we need any kind of assistance. So there is a lot of people that would love to help you and be able to be there for you, but we don't out open ourselves to that either. And like somehow what, if men don't know about menopause and what their partners are going through, don't you think that would make them up again, if we're looking at the core value of being needed to be seen, heard and understood, imagine if your partner could see here and understand to a degree of what you're moving through or how challenging it is. And it's not just, just get up and go that it would really make our relationships so much closer. Again, it boils down to telling the emotional truth. And if you're, if the person doesn't have the capacity or the willingness to be able to sit in that emotional truth with you, to me, that that's an indication that that's someone who needs to do some of their own yeah. work. Yeah. The last myth of grief, keep busy. Well, I think we all do that, don't yeah. we? I mean, we grow, we are, we're in a society that really values productivity, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, no pain, no gain, and all of these things. It is shifting slightly, the languaging, which is good to hear. But I think because we've grown up believing that, whether it was with parents who were like, you've got to work hard to be successful and there, you know, so there's some conditioning around earning and supporting families and doing all those things, which are important. And also just the, everything that's moving on, our world is moving so much faster. There's so much more to distract us. Um, everybody's um, attention span is very short in yeah. this day and age. And so what happens is we've lost the ability to connect with ourselves. We need, we're not machines. We can't go 24 seven without there being some kind of breakdown or some sort of consequence for that. We are human beings and we need time to integrate and embody these changes and things that are happening to us, which takes a level of time mm -hmm. for that to happen. And so when we're not integrating and we're not embodying it, we're operating from our intellectual space always. And as we know, we need to drop 10 inches down into our heart and really be honest about what's coming up for us in terms of that. So the keep busy, we do it with our phones. We do it with like social media. We do it with our job, working out, being with our families. So we stay busy, which just keeps us disconnected from what's going on with ourselves physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And so I would really encourage all your viewers to carve out time in your week where it's like, give yourself a break from the phone, mm -hmm. take an hour away from the family, right? Do something for yourself where you can just be still. We've lost the ability to just be in stillness. And it's in the quiet that our own inner guidance can rise and that we can hear it. Because with the noise and the busyness, yeah. we can't. And then we, the years go by and we wonder why we're frustrated, resentful, angry, guilty, feeling guilty, all of these things. And it's like, give yourself the space and grace and time that you need to move through these experiences. And the permission, the permission to just sit and do nothing. Yeah. You don't need permission. Take, perm take it. Take the time. Yeah. Right? It's it's the advice we would give to friends. Mm -hmm. But we don't take our own We're advice. We're not kind to ourselves. Absolutely. So the compassion. I think, you know, if I, today's top message from you is compassion. Yeah. It's the compassion and, again, telling the emotional truth. Yeah. We're so afraid of telling our truth because we're afraid of what the fallout's going to be. Will there be a change? Does my relationship fall apart now because my partner can't meet me where we are? And that may or may not be the truth. And what we have to discover for ourselves is, is it worth it then? Is it worth it for me to continue to feel like this for the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. Or does something need to shift and change? And it doesn't have to be a whole blow up your world, but by setting some of these like healthy boundaries and being aware and, and finding that awareness and then being, okay, I'm gonna shift some things and asking for people's support as you move through that very valuable. And it allows the people to be like, of course, I'd be happy to do that. And sometimes maybe a little pushback because maybe mm -hmm. now they have to take on more responsibility. And it's be us being able to give up the responsibility that really wasn't ours to always own to begin with in the yeah. first place. Well, Kirsten, myth busting was tremendously helpful. Hopefully our viewers uh, can 
can get rid of some of these misconceptions that we've internalized. And I've sent you a link for an ebook that um, I really encourage all your uh, watchers or viewers to to take a peek at. Obviously, it's a free gift, so great. Feel free to like take use of all of those tools that you can have. And if anybody wants to have a conversation with me, I'm always open for that. We'll have all those resources in our description of our episode. Thank you so much for coming back. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Beatrice. I get so many questions and comments about hair in midlife. It's a real pain. It's thinner, we lose our hair, obviously tied to our declining levels of estrogen. What do I do to maintain as healthy as possible hair through midlife. I use a scalp massager. When you're running it through your scalp, you're doing a couple of things. You're getting rid of dead cells, product buildup, and excess oil. Massaging also helps with blood circulation. So all of this will promote healthy growth environment. And that's really important in midlife. So if you wanna kick it up a notch, don't just use a massager. You can also use scrubs like this one, Verb, Ghost Exfoliating Scalp Nectar. It smells amazing. So together, they really achieve maximum exfoliating effect to get rid of all that product and cells and oil. 